Okay, everyone, I'm going to talk to you about something we call process reality. Sounds maybe a bit fancy, uh, but I am going to explain that, and I think you'll see it's very crucial. It's got a lot to do with the way the world actually does work. It's a concept that was introduced by an English philosopher called Alfred North Whitehead. He was a pal of uh, Bertrand Russell. In fact, together they wrote a very famous book called Principia Mathematica, a great 20th century work on mathematics. But they went their way slightly because Bertrand Russell was a bit of a toffee nose and a, he was a very materialistic sort of person. He was, he was famous for a saying in the 50s, you know, when it was uh, ban the bomb marches and campaign for nuclear disarmament, he was famous for saying, better red than dead. In other words, I'd rather be under the Russians than dead. Um, some would agree with him, maybe some not. But, you know, he was, um, he was not the world's most popular philosopher, whereas I've got to tell you, Alfred North Whitehead is easily the most beloved philosopher of the 20th century. He's, he was very prolific, his writing style was very dense, very difficult to read, and yet much beloved. So it's led to the fact that he's often quoted, Alfred North Whitehead is often said to be the most quoted and least read philosopher. Well, you know, I've extracted some juice out of what he did write, and particularly he had this idea of process reality, which I've simplified very much for supernoetics, and I think you'll see that it leads into some very fascinating places. I'm going to start with a diagram or a schema of what he means by process reality. And it goes like this, okay? This is time. So through time, we get an effect like this, where there's a start. That's the start of your process. There was some kind of change, process taking place, and then eventually it would come to an end. Now, this might seem laughably simple, but trust me, it's one of the most powerful mechanisms in thinking and philosophy, and I aim to prove that in the rest of this talk, okay? Uh, pro by process, we mean some kind of event or change. If the, nothing changes, nothing happened, so you couldn't call that a process. But Whitehead was exceptional, and he extended this to everything. I mean, the obvious simple thing would be, say, a mountain. You know, a mountain springs up, that's the start. Uh, it goes through a process of weathering, aging and decay, and is gradually eroded, and then it eventually ends up back level with the ground. That, that's the end of the process, no more mountain. On a more human scale, you can see it with a motor car. A motor car is made, it's manufactured, it comes out of the factory, it's driven around for 20, 30, 50 years, whatever, gradually rusts and decays, until it's no good, it's junk, it's taken to the scrapyard and then dismembered. Uh, the molecules don't go away, of course, we know that from basic physics, but the form of the car disappears forever. Once that's broken up and all the parts vanished and distributed, you cannot then pull that car back together again. You can only create another car that's very similar. Okay, so that's, that's what we mean by a process loop. It's very simplistic. In fact, uh, I have a jokey term for this, which is slices of eternity. And these slices are very crucial to how we think and how we behave, and I'm going to show you that, as I said, during this course. For example, one very simple adaptation of these, this concept is what I call an action loop. This is really a loop. Okay, we're used to this word, loop. You know, something is put up in the air and eventually comes down the other side. We've closed the loop, okay? Uh, an action loop would go like this. Same, same schema. And there would certainly be a start. You took some action which could be, well, would be signified by change, wouldn't it? So change is crucial to this idea. And then at some time later, either quite quickly or quite slowly, it comes to an end. Let me put a, a dash there, then it shows I'm not using the word action change. It means taking action to produce change. So, for example, to go back to the the car idea, you know, you get in the car, start the engine, that's here. You drive the car to the supermarket and you park the car in the, uh, in the parking lot of the supermarket. That's the end of that particular action loop. Uh, or if you like, if you want to see it as a shopping expedition, you leave the house in the car, you go to the 
store, you buy the goods you want, you come home and repark the car at home. It depends, you know, how you want your loop to be structured. Okay, now one of the thing, the first things I want to teach you using this very simple model is two things. First of all, efficiency and secondly, power. Now efficiency, this, listen to this carefully, efficiency is the orderly way in which you complete your process loops or your action loops, if you like. You have to complete them, otherwise you're not achieving much. You know, starting things all over the place is not doing anything. It's just creating model. So starting and not finishing is, n is not action loops. This is not process or change. So, the mo you know, if you've got a lot of these loops, are not good. I'll come back to that in a minute. But efficiency is completing loops, uh, completing the cycle or the process loop properly. Meaning you've done what you intended to do fully and completely. There's no flying around loose ends or something just going to come back and smack you in the face six months later. That's efficiency. Okay, now power. Listen, we're all interested in mental and powers, the ability to get things done, you know, force of mind, spiritual intensity, power, determination, all of those things. What's that? That is the speed at which you complete loops. So if you do one loop a month, that's one level of power. But if you can do a hundred loops a month, it means you're flying along, you're in a real power state, you're a go-getter, you get things done. So that's power. Okay, so don't mix up the two. They are both aspects of the same thing. Efficiency is completing loops properly and power is how fast you do that. Now, let me tell you how important this is to state of mind. And to illustrate that, I'm going to uh, quote another person who you may not have heard of, a Russian lady, whoops, spelling her name wrong, Bluma, B-L-U-A, sorry, B-L-U-M-A, Zyganik. And she made a very interesting observation. The, the legend... The story, the tradition, as it were, is this was in a cafe in Paris. She was a Russian uh, psychologist living and working in Paris. Uh, that she spotted this with waiters in a restaurant. And this was what she saw, which was that waiters who were Russian... And you, could, you probably, probably relate this to your own memory. I've seen it many times since I read uh, Bluma Zaganik's work. That waiters, or servers as they call them here in the USA... And they run around with all kinds of stuff in their head and somehow by magic they seem to remember what every table had, you know, and they can walk around, you can stop them. And, oh yes, I remember, you know, so and so and so and so. They, they carry it in their head, okay? But this is what Zaganik noticed. The minute you cash out, get the bill and pay, pff, it's all gone. They can't remember anything. They can't remember what you had, nothing. It's all vanished. And her theorization was that these things stay active in mind while they are open loops. Okay? So let's try and draw an open loop. Instead of closing, it's kind of open. Open loop. So not a full process. But hear what I'm saying, which is that she noticed that this hangs around quite intently in the person's mind until they do close the loop. So what we're saying here is a, a, a degree of functional inefficiency by leaving loops open. It will keep your mind cluttered. And if you're a server or a waiter, that's okay, no bad thing. Maybe, you know, six tables, eight tables, ten tables. But let's say you hardly ever close your loops. And, you know, your brain is full of thousands of things you've started, you're meaning to do, still never finished, you've got a closet full of clutter, you've got a computer hard drive that's full of things that never got finished, letters that never got written. Can you see what I'm saying? That you're going to be pretty inefficient. You're going to, be, you're going to have all these open attention loops which will command your attention. We can do that, look at that diagrammatically. Look, let's put it this way. Uh, let's say here's a person. Okay, uh, not a very attractive person, but, and I'm not going to represent brain, that's there, right? Let's put the mind up here, because, you know, in supernoetics, we don't think mind is in brain. But whether we do or not, let's just represent the mind with that, that schematic, okay? Here's the mind. Well, if your mind is full of unfinished loops and crud, what do you think's going to happen? You know, I mean, I'm modeling it like this. Uh, What's going to happen gradually through the time 
is that your brain and your mental functions become inefficient because they start to clutter up as you've got more and more and more and more open loops. Okay, so uh, you can almost see this visually, that the mind becomes engaged with too many things. There's too many incomplete things hanging around, okay? And of course, the counter to that, and I'll explain that in a minute, is to start closing loops. You know, if you can find as many of these things as you can and shut them down so that they become closed loops, then you have a lot more mind. Let's call this attention units. You know, the blackened ones are cluttered or, you know, filled up attention units. And then the white ones are maybe open or available attention units. You see that person isn't very efficient. They've got, he's got far more clutter than he's got open attention units. In other words, not so much available mind for attention to what the person's trying to do, whether it's trying to make a million dollars, trying to be a great lover, trying to educate somebody about something. If you've got fewer attention units, you're not going to be so good at it. So this is a very, uh, very important model for us, really. And I want to show you this another, well, just imagine all these, or most of these black, uh, you know, filled out or distracting our attention units got rid of, and you'll see what I mean, the efficiency of the mind will declutter and improve enormously. I want to look at this in a different way too. Let's look at it, uh, let's look at t or the time or the illusion of time and the back to this point of efficiency. This is again a point I want to make. This is time going forward, okay? And if you have, if you keep closing all your loops, you know, you're very efficient and that's what you usually do, then what you'll see is something like this, okay? You'll see loop after loop being closed, no problem. And what you're actually seeing visually, if you like, is quite a good representation, isn't it? Maybe there's some bigger loops as well. There's one that started there but finished there, and one that started here but eventually finished here. What you'll see by closed loops, these are all closed, equals time progress, right? time forward. I mean, it almost looks like time rushing forward, doesn't it? So if you want, you know, you're getting there, as it were. That's efficient, you know, and you could, as, as I say, you can almost see it visually if you compare it with this other version, which is open loops. So there's our time again, and here's open loops, right? Wandering around all over the place. Nothing getting done. Uh, I'm not going to mix up closed and open, I'm just going to show you lots of open loops. Can you see what's happening? Which is that time really isn't, it's not really like anything's moving, you know, we're not going from here to here. Um, so this is showing you almost visually that with open loops, what happens is that time slows. Whoops. Time slows. That's the feeling you get. You know, it's not good telling me, well, the clock goes just as fast. What's happening is that this person is not getting through their work. They're not getting through their program. And so this, the person who's not closing loops and leaving them open is sludging up, if you like, slowing down mentally, blocking the process, blocking efficiency, blocking power. So Already we've got a very simple tip for better living, which is never leave loops open or close them if you can, if you've got open loops. Well, in fact, one of the best uh, ways I describe this really is to make a list of all the open loops you've got. And trust me, you could probably fill 20 pages of A4 or US letter <laughs> just with open loops you've got. If you really start to dig and dig, you know, not just, uh, you know, I must ask the boss for a raise. I mean, that's probably a biggie and that's right in your face. But very simple, trivial things, you know, I still haven't, uh, you know, bought some weed killer to fix the, uh, the, the path by the pond or something like that. Lots and lots and lots of open loops. We saw on the other page that these still distract attention. They still create this so-called zyganic effect, the inefficiency effect. Now, as I said, it's great for waiters when they've only got two or three or four tables. But if you've got several hundred significant open loops, then you're going to bump into this, which is you'll slow down, you'll sludge up, you'll be less efficient. And we want sparkling efficiency. Like th this is the person, you know, that earns a million dollars, that changes the world, that gets the promotion he wants, that marries the girl he uh, most desires. This is the guy that eventually ends up sitting on the 
sofa drinking beer and eating pretzels and watching TV isn't going anywhere. You can see the two kind of people almost visually in what I'm saying. Okay, so very important to you, closed loops. And uh, you know, I've got several uh, documented uh, instruction, uh, hacks as we call them, hacks or you know, little procedures. Uh, there's a full rubric on it, in fact, in, in uh, Supernoetics, which you need to get a hold of and read. Let's look at another aspect of this now, which is taking that process loop and adding at something else, which is really very important. So I'll go back to doing the basic diagram. There's your loop, start, end, and the process. Okay whatever that is. It might be an action. Remember I derived an, what we call an action loop from the process loop. The process loop is something that goes on anyway. You know, every seven days that go by, that's a process. Every mountain that appears and disappears, that's a process. Every time a thunderstorm or a hurricane comes through, uh, there's a start and a finish. The pro you know, we're not really much influencing those. But things that we choose to do for ourselves are actions and of course we are responsible for. And here's the important thing. If we add the matter of will, or intent if you like, to use another kind of word, uh, will or intent, the, the things that we want to happen, then again we're talking about the subject of power. If we can impose our will on a process loop, in other words, get what we want from start to finish, then we are empowered. We have, you know, we are causative. The person with all those open loops is not very causative, but we are. So again, developing the habits of finishing what you start uh, closing the loop, and I mean closing it properly, not in a, any sort of half-baked way so that it hits you in the face months later because you didn't finish it. Properly closed, properly gone so that the zygonic effect isn't kicking in, then that's very powerful for you and you'll be very successful. It's something that you want to culture and cultivate, okay? If you can add the will process. But there are parts to this, right? This is a sort of start imposing your will and uh, the process to the end. One is to be causally, to, to, to be able to start things that you, let's, let's number these, okay, to start things that you want to start, that you are causal, things will happen because you caused them to happen. They didn't just by chance, you did that. So that's causal intent or will, okay. Now you can also have a negative intent or will and that's preventing something Remember that's, let me just finish the word prevention. Remember that's another kind of efficiency, you know, being able to do what's important and get done what we want to be done, very important for success in life. But also it's almost as equally important, if not equally important, that we're able to stop or prevent the things that we don't want. Okay, if you're going to do good things and get what you want, but you're all cluttered up with tons of stuff you didn't want, that's not very good either. So we have to be preventative causally as well as intentionally causative. So we can start what we want, we can stop what we don't want. And then finally, the desired transformation. In other words, it didn't just start, we got the result. That's, that's the... Uh, the, the process, the, the transformation, remember in the original process loop I showed you the idea of transformation, that's really what's taking place. Getting the desired result or outcome. Now to me those are the three really significant factors in the ability to control our lives, to take power, empower ourselves and do good things and do successful things. Again, I can't say it enough, you've got to be able to cause the things you want to happen, prevent the things that would be a problem if they did happen, and that you want to get the, the, basically the outcome that you intended. If you, get, if you get some other outcome, that's not really being you know, very much in control anyway. Okay, now, being able to control things is a very significant factor uh, psychologically. There is that feeling, and you know what that feeling when you recognize it, that you're, you know, when you're, when you're winning, you're on top, you know, it's equal to your talent, you can start, create, transform things, bang, 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 you're efficient. And let me contrast that with the opposite sort of effect, where you're not. And a good example I use for this, 
and a lot of people appreciate when they see what I'm saying, has to do with going in, say, a shopping mall, and it's a very, you know, a very exclusive, expensive shopping mall. All these wonderful stores with these beautiful, wonderful things on display. You know, whatever diamond tiaras, or you can buy yourself a jet plane, you know, buy yourself a leopard if you want. But you haven't got the money, okay? So you're seeing all these gorgeous things, but you have no control over them. They're not in your domain. They're not under your control. They're not likely to be because of the kind of cost that's involved. You may have had this experience staring in exclusive shop windows in New York or London, Tokyo, any city in the world. And what happens is that you feel very detached and you kind of feel thin and spacey and sort of strung out and, oh, you know, you are so, so disconnected, really, uh, that it's not, it's really not a good experience. You know, it's, a, it's very negative to be out of control to such a significant degree. So, of course, you know, part of the message is don't just go browsing malls, or if you do, keep it short. Go and browse somewhere where there's something you can buy. You know, go to a fishing shop where you can say, oh, well, I'll buy one of those out of my salary next week. Or if you're not a salaried person, you're an entrepreneur, you know, go to places where you can afford what you see. There's an old saying um, that if, you're, if you need to ask the price, uh, then you're not rich enough, okay? You should go to places where you don't need to ask the price, you know you can afford it. So if, you know, if you're on a certain salary and you go to certain kinds of stores, you know you're gonna have to ask the price so that you don't get tripped up. Uh, it's better to shop in stores where you don't need to ask the price. It's an old joke, but it's explaining a principle that's worth bearing in mind, okay? And I can illustrate that one final way before I finish, which is at home. You know, if you're in a let's say you're not, you know, your mom's in charge, you know, you're living at home. If you're not now or if, you know, the mom is long gone, then think back or either that or do a thought experiment and picture yourself as somebody living at home again with your parents. And your mom is a stickler for tidiness. You know, every time you put something down, it's cleared away, it's scrubbed and polished and gone, you know, you can't find anything. You put something down and poof, it's vanished and you've got to wait till she comes home to say, you know, where did you put my book about so-and-so? Uh, that can be very exasperating because you're not in control, okay? So although you live in a beautiful, neat, tidy, immaculate, spotless home, which in principle is good, but in actual fact is crap because it kicks in all this mechanism of not being able to go out, reach, contact and control things. Contrast that in the opposite, which you live in this messy slob house with socks everywhere and dirty underpants and books lying, magazines lying everywhere. Okay, a complete mess. But you are comfortable and you're relaxed because you can go and move any item of that. Nobody's going to criticize. You know, if you want to leave the washing up for a couple of days, you know, they're already piled up to here. You can do that. There's nobody there to criticize you. So that's comfortable. Now, obviously, you can't go too far. If you never do any washing up, it's back to being not in control. You can't start things that you need to start and need to, you know, get a proper result, which is, you know, keep the keep the crocks and dishes uh, clean. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? If, uh, to live in a very nice place where you've got no control is a rather negative experience compared to living in a slobby place where, you know, you're, you're, you're definitely in control, okay? So I hope these thoughts, you know, trigger some good ideas for you. This is very powerful stuff. Uh, as I said, slices of eternity, my term for these little kind of bites, these little processes, they can be ever so tiny. Listen, if you go into the quantum world, these things can be like a billionth of a second. You know, a particle appears and disappeared. If you're a geologist, on the other hand, you know, a mountain can appear and take hundreds of millions of years to disappear. So it's all relative what the actual time scale is. But what I want you to do is relate the principle to human experience. And that's producing our transformative changes. That's just a posh way of saying getting the outcomes you want. But the very first starting place is to close every loop you can get your hand on. So you get sheets of paper and you write down everything that you've not finished. Listen, you can go back 20, 30 years if you want. This still works, but make sure you get everything out of your brain onto paper and then start working at closing those loops. As I said, there is, you know, an express and some other written directives on this which you can use, but in principle, that's what you do. And then instead of starting with the most difficult one, by the way, which most gurus would teach you, they'd say, you pick the really big thing you haven't finished that's really standing in your way. Ah, that's crazy. You'll just fall flat on your face as you've been doing all those years. 
what you do is pick the easy things, something really simple, you know, like I'll go and pick some, uh, you know, paper and clutter up off the yard at the back, I'll clean things up, you know, just some simple thing that you can do in 10 minutes. Um, the same, you know, might be true in the house, you know, you go and throw out some stuff, some trash from the closet, you don't schedule, you know, a whole redecoration of the room where you need to call in contractors and ways to cover the floor and you choose the paint and then you've got the paintbrush, you put your overalls on, you spend two... This is big, right? Okay, pick small things and knock as many small things off the list as you can. There are two reasons for doing that. One is you'll shrink the list quickly, meaning you'll close more loops faster. And closed loops is what it's all about. The second thing is what I found over the, you know, 20 or 30 years I've been teaching this is what happens... You you're actually increasing your ability to do things, you know, you get better at it, you get more efficient at closing loops, so when you come to tackle the bigger stuff, it really works for you. Wonderful stuff, thank you Alfred North Whitehead. This is one of our big properties in supernoetics, the whole idea of the process loop and process reality. Okay, thanks very much for listening, take care.